Hey everyone, welcome to the DMI SU Open Day. Um, this is our first SU event, so we're very excited. I hope you all are too. Just a brief note before we start, uh, can you all just enable speaker view? So it should be a grid in the top right hand corner. If you click it, then you can choose speaker view. Um, also, if you can all just keep your, keep your mics muted for now. Uh, so yeah, thank you all for joining. Sorry we couldn't have this in person. But it's just with COVID restrictions, it's a bit difficult at the moment. So here we are on Zoom. So just a brief overview of what's going to happen today. We'll start off with some introductions from the SU members. And then we'll have a fun little quiz for you guys. That will be followed by some videos that we've prepared to show you a bit about Dnipro. Then, then we'll be having an interview with Dr. Valentine, um, cardiothoracic and pediatric surgeon. He will be answering some of your questions sent by you guys. And lastly, we'll be taking our questions from you. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask, please note it down and we'll answer them later at the end. So to kickstart it, kick introductions, I'm Bilal. Hi, oh, hi I'm Laurie. <laughs> I'm Sastika. I'm Rabia. I mean, we're the events team. So our role in the SU is just to organize events such as this one we're having now. Uh, mostly academic events are so things like workshops, um, things like what we're doing first aid, basic life support, and things like that. So if you have any events that you want us to organize for you, just please let us know. Um, so for the rest of the in SU introductions. Hi everyone, I'm Hani and I'm the co-chair of the student union. Um, one of my primary roles is uh, being in charge of preclinical years, so being in charge of all the year leaders, helping organize them, giving them their tasks. And I also help uh, lead the student union with my co-chair, Christina. Um, and what we hope to achieve, what I hope to achieve is DMI becoming a better environment for students to study in uh, so that we can achieve the job prospects we dream of and enjoy it while we're doing it. Hi guys, I'm Christina. I'm the other co-chair of the student union. And my main responsibility is heading the clinical years. So I directly look after all of the year leaders who um, report to me. And then he reports, Hani looks after all of the year leaders from preclinical. Um, our main goal is why we started the student union is to in, uh, include the students in the voice of the university and make sure that all their concerns were addressed in an organized fashion and that the university becomes a place that every student wants to study at and their voices are heard. So if you ever have any concerns, whether it be big or small, please feel free to reach out to the student union. We are here to make your experience better. Um, and our vision is just to really build um, with you guys and be a student-led initiative. And I will now head over to Keisha. Uh, so hi, my name is Keisha. I'm the student union secretary and I'm more of a behind the scenes person. So I'm the person that's most likely responding to your emails when you bring them, send them through. I make sure everyone knows where they are in terms of our tasks that we're trying to do. So I'm more of an organization role. Um, my aim is to ensure that effective communication is given to students. So when we do get information from the Dean's office or agencies, we try to send out to you as soon as possible. Um, and I hope that by the end of the year, we will have a large majority of students being signed up to our email database so you can all receive our updates. So yeah, now we'll introduce you to the rest of the team. Hi everyone, um, I'm Ara, um, I am head of the general committee, so as you'll probably notice that we, our student union is split into the executive committee and then the general committee, so in the executive committee you'll meet pretty much everyone that's here today, uh, everyone has very specific roles here, um, and then we have a general committee which is basically for um, all the rest of the students in our student union, um, it's open to kind of people that want to offer skills for any workshops we have and that have any ideas um, and things like that. So my role is kind of very integrative to kind of encourage other students that want to contribute something, have any ideas um, to kind of put them forward to the executive committee so that we can actually implement them and put them in touch with the right people to do so.
Hi everyone, my name is Leanne and I'm the research officer for the Student Union. My role entails providing information on research opportunities to any students who are interested in starting research and students who've got a research background who'd like to continue here at DMI. So the plan for the upcoming year is firstly to start a journal club where we will be inviting speakers, hopefully monthly, to um, speakers of um, from the DMI and these will be academic researchers who are currently doing research and publishing in international journals to present their work to us and this will provide students with an opportunity to pair up with academics who are currently doing research here at DMI and we also want to use the journal club as a space for capacity building so we will be inviting some um, some um, uh, people with interesting stories post-medical school in Ukraine to come share with us their post-medical school journey that would include um, how they cleared board exams or life after Ukraine. Secondly, we'd like to have workshops on uh, capacity building again to introduce students to research methods. So for any students who are in whatever journey they are in their um, in their publishing, we would like to have workshops to invite um, experienced researchers to help them out uh, where they are. Lastly, hopefully, we'd like to have a symposium where students get to showcase some of the work they've been working on throughout the year. So this would be later in the year where students get to um, present to other students what they've been working on. I think that's it. <laughs> yeah. So we'll hand over to the rest. <laughs> Hi guys, I'm Christiana, I'm your social media officer, so I'm the face behind um, the socials. My role in the SU is basically managing all our social media platforms and promoting the SU. Um, I promote and advertise like all events to get like the possible, the best possible turnout. And what I hope to achieve by the end of the year is our platform being known by like all, all and also increasing attendance of events. And my name is Jean-Pierre <laughs> and this is my co- My name is Lara. Yep, we are the social officers. So basically what we're planning to do is get more social activities for people within the university to be doing together. Zara, is going, Zara and I will be responsible for uh, we're going to be uh, managing and arranging, creating all the societies and clubs. So if there's any society, any club that you'd like to start, you come to us, you email us, and we'll hopefully get the ball rolling for that. Exactly. It can be music, sports, even anything recreational. For example, I like anime, so I'm making an anime society. So once a week we'll be doing that. And also we'll be in charge of Freshers Week as well, which we're planning to start from the 26th of October, and it'll be a two-week Three events each week so look forward to that soon yeah and that's all i will call the next yeah. So my name is Sabiha and I'm the year leader for third year. Hello, my name is Valerie and I'm the year leader for fifth year. Hi guys, my name is Mahara and I am the year leader for second years. And we're going to talk briefly about the roles of year leaders. The main um, role of year leaders is to guide the group leaders for each year. So um, we get feedback from them and usually that will be passed on to Hani who is in charge of the pre-clinical years and for clinical years that would yeah. be Christina yeah and it also concern um, our role also is connected with um, communication with the teachers and making sure that the feedback given by students is addressed Amira. Hi guys, my name is Amira and I'm the head of dentistry of the SU as well as a fourth year leader. We have Dania who represents the third year and we have Mila who represents the fifth year. Uh, we're also looking for first and second year rep, so whoever is interested, please drop us a message. And uh, my role as the head is to be your voice. I know that dentistry tends to be neglected, but not anymore. 
So we're planning uh, to create a bit of a patient database. So then we can have more patient because we need volunteers. So we try, we're trying to get a few patients from meddling students themselves who could volunteer to us. Okay, um, we're going to try to increase our practical skills as well. And we hopefully we are planning to have some workshops that will allow us to increase our manual dexterity. And <coughs> okay, so if anyone uh, have any question or if you think anything that will be useful for the dentistry students that will help us, please let us know. And I hope you guys have a great year despite the COVID situation. Thanks guys. Uh, thanks Amira, so that was introductions done. So now Keish is gonna send in the link to join the quiz. So if you can all click the quiz and then we'll read the questions along and you can follow on with us. Oh yeah, um, there's prizes for the quiz, so try your best. <coughs> we'll give you a couple of minutes to join the link and then we'll start in like a minute or so. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna start with the biology question. Are you guys all ready to go? Just give us a thumbs up. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So with the biology question, question number one: What is the name of the fibrous protein in the skin that forms a barrier and keeps microorganisms out? <laughs> question number two: You decide to walk up the stairs. Which part of your brain is associated with this decision? Yeah, question number three. As you walk up the stairs, you start sweating. Which part of your brain initiates the increase in temperature? Question number four. The immunity caused by B lymphocytes is called? Question number five. Which vein brings oxygenated blood from the lungs to the heart? Question number six. What does hyperplasia mean? Question number seven, when one gene, when one gene pair hides that has the effect of the other units, this is referred to as. Okay, I'll give you guys some time to answer the biology question before I move ahead to the chemistry ones. Uh, once you finish the biology questions, you can just click next and it'll take you to the second section. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're ready to start chemistry questions. Okay, so these yeah. are the chemistry questions. Um, so there are about 10 questions in total, which is an MCQ base. So I'll start off with the first question. Uh, which of the following is used in pencil? So you've got um, sulfur, phosphorus, charcoal, or graphite. Um, Okay, question number two. The alkaloid naturally found in coffee, cocoa and cola nut is cocaine, morphine, caffeine or tannin? Question number three. The percentage of nitrogen present in ammonium sulfate is 30.5%, 18%, 21% or 25%. Question number four, heavy metals got the name because compared to other atoms, they have higher atomic mass, higher atomic numbers, higher densities, higher atomic radii. Question number five, hydrogen peroxide is an effective sterilizing agent which one of the following product results when it readily loses active oxygen? Um, nasal hydrogen, ozone, water, or hydrogen? 
Okay, and okay. um, the question number six is the rusting of metal iron in air needs both. Um, option number A, water and paint. Option number B, oxygen and grease. Option number C, oxygen and moisture. Option number D, carbon dioxide and moisture. Question number seven, transboundary pollution or acid rain is caused by option A, hydrocarbon, option B, nitrogen oxide and sulfur dioxide, option C, carbon monoxide, and option D, carbon dioxide. Question number eight, which of the following is not a noble gas? Option A, helium, option B, hydrogen, option C, neon, and option D, argon. Question number nine, which of the following is not a form of carbon? A, soot, B, graphite, C, hematite, D, charcoal. Okay, and the final one, um, question number 10. Dry ice is nothing but A, gaseous carbon dioxide, B, carbon monoxide, C, washing soda, and D, sol solid carbon dioxide. And again, if you want to click next, it'll take you to the next to section. Next so the last section is the brain teasers, and this is one of my favorite because it gets you thinking. So question number one, which is heavier, a pound of wool or a pound of bricks? I'll give you a couple of seconds to think about that one. Okay, question number two, can you write down eight, eight so that they add up to 1,000? So write down eight, eight, so they add up to 1,000. So basically just eight lots of eights and it has to be all addition, no multiplication, nothing else, just addition. So it has to be eight, eight, and it has to add up to a thousand. Okay, number three, okay. what English word retains the same pronunciation even after you take away four of its five letters? So I'll repeat that again. What English word retains the same pronunciation even after you take away four of its five letters? Okay, the last question. What is it that when you take away the whole, you still have some left? What is it? That, sorry, last question. What is it that when you take away the whole, you still have some left? And that's it for the quiz. Thank you for taking part. So how do you submit? So, so yeah, when you they just click submit, right? So yeah, when you're done, you just click submit. Um, your results will be generated and then we'll let you know in an email probably by the end of the day who the winner is. Yeah. So um, good luck to everyone. We'll also announce it on Instagram on, the, on yeah, our story Instagram. as well. So keep keep an eye out for this. And make weekend. sure you're following our Instagram. DMI.SU. Yeah, DMI.SU. <laughs> DMI <laughs> okay, now I think everyone's done with the quizzes. So now we're just gonna show some videos that we've prepared to give you a bit of insight into Dene Pro. Um, this will be on our YouTube channel, so also in the email we'll send a link to the YouTube channel, so please subscribe and then you can watch the videos there. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Woo! <laughs> it's working.
So yeah, that was just a short video showing you around Dnipro. <laughs> yeah, showing you around Dnipro and then they just short accommodation video, just giving you insight on how, like the step-to-step -step process of the accommodation process. Um, now we're going to have an interview with um, Dr. Valentine. So Shastika is going to be conducting the interview. If... Hi everyone, um, again. So now we're going to have an um, interview with Dr. Valentine, who is the pediatric and cardiac thoracic surgeon. And he is also uh, the integral part of the DMI um, Institute team. So let's welcome Dr. Valentine. Hello, Dr. Valentine. Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hello, hello. Can you hear me, guys? <laughs> Hi, yeah. So would you like to start by saying a little bit about you? Uh, that's a good interesting question, actually. Uh, what I can say about myself, I'm a teacher. I'm teaching surgery, starting usually third year, ending sixth year. I uh, teach uh, general surgery, clinical surgery, uh, hospital surgery, and pediatric surgery as well. Plus, I'm the one who usually taking part in CROC exams and state exams at the end of your education. So like that also in the institute i'm the chief of the working practice so if you have any kind of question about working practice in the institute you're supposed to contact with me about that so that's like that thank you very much so the first question and um, that we gathered from students are uh, what's the best experience you have received throughout your medicine journey interesting question actually because um, there is I can't uh, give you some one example about this kind of experience, but uh, in general, when you see the patient, when you see the case, you manage to put the correct and proper diagnose, uh, prescribe proper treatment, and the people get well really fast, and they are actually um, grateful to you for your job. I think that's the best benefit of the work. And as well as a side effect of being a doctor is when you're walking through the crowd of people, you see the people around the streets and you're just making the diagnosis like that. Like you have atherosclerosis, you have sclerodermia or something like that, you know? Well, that's very nice. <laughs> so <laughs> the next question is, um, what do you recommend for students to get more clinical experience in the Negro? That's a hard question for me. Um, to get more experience, especially in Nipro, you're supposed to find yourself a mentor. That's the best option. Primary, you need to find out what's your target, what's your purpose to come to medicine, to pick the branch. You want to be the internal medicine doctor or a surgeon or pediatrician. 
And then when you picked the side, <laughs> or white or black side, then you find yourself a person who can talk in English, who can guide you through the medical work, who can uh, introduce you to the medical staff and who will allow you to shadow them, to help them, and then with time uh, to do their job for them. That will be the best option for practice, I think. Oh, thank you very much. That's very that's a very insightful. <laughs> so next question Actually, is uh, how I did the practice with myself. I found myself a mentor that helped me to yeah. get the practice in the beginning. So I think you have the old chances to get the same. Okay. So that's another option for students. Um, so the next question uh, we have accumulated is how, um, what's the best method of studying and how do you organize yourself as a medical or dental student? What are your tips? Well, how to organize your own education, I can't do the program for you, but I can say to you that <laughs> what you don't need to do for sure, you don't need to be a nerd. You don't need to dig into the details. You don't need to try to mechanically memorize everything to get the proper mark. The mark is not the indicator about the knowledge. The knowledge is the understanding of the problem, is the understanding of the situation. If you actually understand the disease, if you can think clinically, uh, then you'll succeed for everything. You don't need to read a lot of books. You need to develop your understanding of the problem. For that, it's really helpful, the basic knowledge of the first three years, like uh, physiology, pathophysiology, anatomy, and everything else. And one another kind of recommendation I can give to the students is the fact that um, you should pick the site as soon as possible. If you're example, for example, if you picked a decision that you want to be a surgeon in the first year of education, you going through all the education with the thought that you have a target to be a surgeon and you will focus on that, the one that you're actually interested in. But if you cannot pick a side and you study till the last point and you cannot find out what kind of doctor you want to be, it's hard because you basically cannot know everything. That's impossible, that's a fact. So pick the branch of medicine that's interesting for you, then pick a mentor for that, and then go and understand the situation. Something like that. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I've got two more questions for you. And um, this one is, how often do you keep up to date with research research and medicine, because as a student, it's quite important to keep in touch with the current news. Well, I'm pre uh, I have a journal that once a month comes to me with the new articles that's uh, coming up in Ukraine. Also, I have an internet, I have Google, and if something new appears in my mind, I Google it, search for it, and read about that. They're helpful when I meet the situations that are pretty extraordinary. I had a couple of them in my life, but um, the last one that was that shocked me a lot, actually, there was a situation about the girl, uh, 14 year, uh, one, four, 14 years old. She got really serious necrosis of the fingers on the legs. And no doctors can do nothing. They consulted around all the city. Nobody can set the proper diagnosis. Nobody can set the proper treatment. Um, after that, I collected the anamnesis from them. It's, I found out that they were in Egypt two years ago, and they walked on the corals, on the dry ones. And using Google, I found an article about two unique cases in the world, in the world that uh, coral poison brings necrotic uh, fasciitis to the person, not just allergy reaction, not just severe allergy reaction that's usually caused by poison of the corals. It, it was the necrotizing fasciitis. And this 
thing is untreatable. The only thing to treat the situation was to cut it off. And unfortunately, parents didn't listen to me. They waited for a year more. And only after that, they was forced to amputate all the fingers on the leg of the child. So, yeah, so I'm staying up to date as much as I can using all the sources that I can. But usually the life, you know, they're guiding you through the new information. So you, you, you use what you can in a given situation. Yeah. And yeah, thank you. And also the last question is, as a surgeon, do you have time to do research on the side? Mm, can you make it detailized in this question? So um, like as a doctor, some people do as a side research. So they, whatever they are keen or interested in, they like to do um, like, um, what do you call? A lab and, research. I understood. Yeah. I understood. Do you have any well, time to do that? We have, as a surgeon, I have time to do that, especially if I'm working in a surgeon and in the institute, the same. I have a chance to do any kind of research that I want. The main question is uh, why? Um, if it's necessary for the scientific uh, degree, then yes, then there is a purpose to do this. If it's just for me, I can, pu I can publish only interesting or unique situations that are usually not required in uh, serious journals. Like the one that I'm describing to you about the corals, it's interesting, it's unique, but um, the journals usually not interested in this kind of cases. They can publish one, two in a journal in a month and together with these kind of situations is uh, hard in our country. But uh, we have time to collect the general information and sometimes I'll I help to the students to find information for their articles and help to publish them as well in the journals. In Ukrainian journals, you have a chance to publish in English as well. It's not forbidden. Thank you very much for your um, answers, Dr. Valentine. And now, <laughs> yeah, now we can open the floor for students. So if you have any FAQs for Dr. Valentine, I don't mind. Don't be shy. Oh, feel free to. Yeah. No, just. Yeah. How would you do this? Louder. Uh, I something. I can't hear you a bit louder. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we've got a question. How is how will it be assessed? Again, assessed. Like how will it be assessed in like lectures and practicals? Come again, I didn't answer the question. How will the students be assessed? Exactly. Examinations and stuff like that. So like, you know how in the year three we have croc and year six we have another croc. So, yeah. but like for the rest of the student, how, how are we gonna get access like MCQs, practical? Well, by the program of education and surgery in the subject that I'm teaching, we have, uh, if you're asking about the program, the uh, we have the, branch that divided in theory, theoretical discussion, and practical. And if you're talking about the exams, like uh, CROC or state exams, they, they're divided as well in three categories, MCQs, practical demonstration of your skills, and theoretical knowledge. As well, there will be a couple examinators, they can ask you additional questions, but mostly to pass these exams, to pass croc, you need to memorize, mechanically memorize the questions, the booklets and the MCQs. To pass practical exams, you need to see and try to do a couple of times each of your practical skills that you're supposed to obtain for six years. And about the theoretical knowledge, well, as careful you listen during the education, as much you read during the education, as easier for you to be to pass the exam and to pass everything. If that was the question. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I think we'll just take some questions now. So thank you, Dr. Valentine. That was really helpful. I hope it was helpful to all of you students as well. Um, thank you for allowing me to uh, be present in your meeting. That was pretty interesting. Actually. <laughs> thank you for your time. <laughs>
Bye, Dr. Valentine. I'm still here. Somebody else wants to guess something. Uh, yeah. Okay, if, so, yeah, so if any student has question, we'll pass the floor to you then. So you just write the questions in the chat box and then we'll take your questions. Um, yeah, again, if you have any questions, just please write them in the chat box and then we'll try and answer them. It's just in case I can't answer the questions. Yeah. So if you want to, do you want to come out? Okay. So our first question is regarding the croc and whether or not it's the, similar to the USMLE from the USA. So croc is the Ukrainian licensing exam. Uh, it's broken up into two papers. There's croc one, which is written at the end of your third year, and croc two, which is written at the end of your sixth year or fifth year if you're a dentistry student. Um, so like the USMLE step one and step two, um, which is a USA licensing exam, it aims to um, evaluate your knowledge of the subject so that you can either pass on to your clinical years or you can officially graduate from the university. Um, we have a very detailed explanation of the CROC and its requirements in our FAQ documents and that will be sent to you guys after this um, Zoom, as well as there's a video that will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, which explains what the CROC is, how it's evaluated, and what it consists of. Um, yes, yeah, so we've got another question. Any tips on learning Ukrainian and Russian, and which is more commonly spoken in Dnipro? So um, Ukrainian is taught in, is it first to third year? Um, first three years. Yeah. So your first preclinical years, Ukrainian is taught, but a lot of the locals here, they speak Russian. So it's handy to learn both. Um, you can download apps like Duolingo and stuff like that to keep your like with common phrases and stuff like that. Um, with the events team, we are working on workshops to organize like clinical terms. So like things like, are you in pain? So that when you do have patients in your clinical years, you'll be able to know that little bit of Russian to interact with them a bit more. Yeah, so um, anything like Duolingo, YouTube videos really, really help. You can um, Google um, the alphabet, the Cyrillic uh, alphabet, so you guys can learn that. Um, but once you're in the city, um, you pick up stuff a lot. Um, and once you're in clinical years, we really do suggest that you guys learn a few phrases so that you can interact with your patients. For example, it's really, really nice if you're able to greet and say Strasovice and introduce yourself as a, a med student so that you can bridge that gap. Um, but like we said, the student union is working on workshops that will be aimed at teaching you guys clinical Russian as it is more widely spoken. But Ukrainian is the official language of Dnipro and it's taught at all um, the educational bodies. And yeah, like with learning any language, um, yeah, you can sort of do basics on YouTube, on apps and whatnot, but to fully learn and understand the language and become fluent in it, you need to go out, put yourself in awkward situations, practice, practice, practice with locals, and just keep at it, you know, fail and succeed, fail and succeed, and that's how eventually you'll become fluent. Um, the next question we have for you, Dr. Valentine, um, and that is um, with regards to what clinical skills do you think third years should master by the end of their third year? Well, um, to become a good surgeon, surgeon is pretty, uh, well, first of all, it's a hand worker. They are working with hands. So primary, the skills that surgeon is supposed to obtain is to micro control of the fingers. That's the start, that's the beginning of the, everything. If the students, some of the students are visited my extra classes as well from this uh, beautiful team that we have here. And among all of the tests, I'm asking students to check how they control their hands. For example, to do like this. Not all of the people can do this side. Okay, then transform this to this. <laughs> <laughs> this you need to transform to this position <laughs> after that you need to do like this oh my god <laughs> <laughs> what? 
yeah, microcontrol of the fingers. That's, what I'm saying. that's the beginning. That's the primary thing. It's teaching you that there is a lot of new thing about your own body that you not didn't even thought about. After that, you controlling and learn to operate with the equipment, learn learn to manipulate with it, and to you discover how the body actually consists from what kind of uh, consistency of the skin, of the internal tissues, and everything like that. And when you get mastered about your hand working, you increasing your knowledge by the theory because how to and what to do is a good thing but primary you need to set the diagnose correctly so the surgeons are usually the most competent people in the hospitals and if have, if nobody else know what to do with patient they ask the surgeon to consult because they know how to people work from the inside practice with your hands practice with the equipment and theoretical knowledge about the diagnostic and treatment programs that's your okay. goal thank you very much doctor i'm sure everyone's going to be practicing <laughs> their hand movements okay so the next question is regards to clinicals and how it's structured so um once you get into your clinical years you now uh enter rotations so we do blocks um so you'll do one subject for example the fourth year's um, our group is busy with the pediatrics block so you'll be doing peds for a set amount of time and then you'll move on to the next subject as opposed to your preclinical years where Hani for example is in his preclinical years and they do um, a whole bunch of subjects <laughs> per semester so that's how clinics versus preclinicals work with regards to structure um what's in do you want to ask me to shout out to that one um so this one's regarding graduate entry I've been told that we'll be joining third year so it's hard to do both croc one and two by the end of third year so you won't do croc one and two by the end of third year. Croc one is done at the end of third year and croc two is done at the end of sixth year. So joining to graduate, joining to third year, you'll only be sitting croc one. Um, half of the subjects are taught in that module, but things like anatomy, histology aren't taught. So those are things you'll have to do in your own time. So probably before coming, maybe just brush upon your anatomy. Um, but there will be event eventually there are plans for extra classes yeah. for graduate entry for anatomy the main request for anatomy uh, Physi uh, physiology. physiology and some clinical skills um, yeah. that will be incorporated yeah so um for the graduate entry students there will be the su is working to introduce extra classes for anatomy physiology and pharmacology as well as uh croc one and croc two classes will be implemented for um the students um, the next question would be to Dr. Valentine, and that would be, what is it like, is it possible to specialize in the Ukraine as a foreign medical student? So as um, an English speaking student, would we be able to practice in the Ukraine as a doctor? Uh, well, yeah, generally, yeah. We uh, have the same rules as generally for other students. In our country, in Ukraine, the person who finished the basic education of six year medicine uh, or dentistry five years, they can go for post ed, uh, post graduation education. And uh, in our country that's called or internship or ordinatorship. So in some countries that's also called the residency, but the name doesn't change the meaning. Uh, the meaning is the practice and working as a doctor. Uh, the amount of years to specialize depends on your future purpose. If you want to specialize and go back to your country and practice, for example, in Great Britain, in Great Britain to become a surgeon, if I'm not mistaken, you need around five years of uh, post-graduation practice or two years of residency and then five years of post-graduation practice. Not sure about the program in uh, UK, but you can pass some of these uh, years in Ukraine. You go for the faculty or the academy of post-graduation education, join it, and uh, setting a contract for the amount of years that you need. In some countries, three years. In some countries, five years. In some countries, two. Depends on your own future target. But if you plan to stay in Ukraine and work in the future as Ukrainian doctor, you're going to specialization. It's uh, 
another kind of residency, another kind of post-graduation education. After that, you will get a certificate of a doctor that allows you to work in Ukraine. So basically for foreign people, there is no restrictions here. Okay, thank you, doctor. We appreciate the, the clarity on that. Um, do you want to talk about that? Uh, yes, yeah, so we've had a few questions about the online course. In regards to the online course, an email will be sent out tomorrow morning answering all your questions and just mm -hmm. all the information basically on, on for the online course. So if you still have questions after that, you can just contact your agency. So um, then the next question is a lot of people are asking how does it work for graduate entry students? So um, depending on where you obviously enter, you either enter into your third, fourth or fifth year um, as a graduate entry or if you're a transfer um, and you transfer from another medical school and you're transferred into your sixth year. Um, it works the same. You guys are in the same groups as the students who have been here since first year. Um, and so if you guys have any other questions regarding graduate entry, um, you can send them to the chat now. We'll take two more questions um, before we wrap it up. And if you have any more questions for Dr. Valentine, let us know and we'll try um, address them for you in an email. Oh, and then a lot of students are asking about the USMLE um, and that they want to write it. And how do they, like, how does that conflict with CROC? So, the USMLE would be something that you guys choose to write on your own. That is something that you elect to do. CROC 1 is mandatory within Ukraine to write, to pass. So uh, you can do with what that, with what you will with that information. But um, our advice is to prioritize CROC 1 because without passing CROC 1 and CROC 2, you won't graduate. And then the USMLE, you need to figure out when is the best time for you to write it um, and when will your studies allow for it. So a lot of the students write the step one in fourth and fifth year as third year they're focusing on crop one and sixth year they're focusing on crop two um so like i said it's it's completely voluntary to write the usmle step one um but croc is mandatory yeah so the usmle is not all necessary especially if you're practicing in the uk you don't really need it a lot of people just sit the usmle as like the extra step but again you don't really need it so yeah. you wouldn't don't really worry about it um i think that's i so think yeah i think that's it for questions and um, we'll be sending out an email with an faq document so that'll be all the questions you've asked plus extra answered for you um we'll send the link to the youtube video as well so you can watch that again um is that really right yeah so can if you the winners? Um, oh yeah so we'll announce the winners in that email as well oh okay we we'll, have, we'll just take one more question we have one sorry. more question sorry we just our secretary is sending us the question <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, so, doctor, this is a question for you. Oh, oh okay. I think it's gone. Anyway, okay. it's fine. We can answer it. Um, I see, sir. Okay, so, doctor, so um, this is a two part question. So, the first question is when should students get a stethoscope and when um, should they start clinically practicing examining patients? Uh, in our program, that's starting from the second year, sometimes from the third year, depending on the subject. So your stethoscope is supposed to be ready somewhere around third year of education. And my recommendation is to buy a good one from the beginning. It's expensive. It's, uh, well, but it's good, you know? And if you will understand the sound from the beginning, that will be a lot more easier in the future. So primary, get yourself, if you plan to get a stethoscope or an endoscope or a state of an endoscope, buy a good one. If the good one, I recommend Lippmann. The It's not an advertisement, it's just the good stethoscopes, one of the best ones. Okay, and then when do you suggest students should start learning to practice their clinical skills on, patient, um, on each other? So clinical examination skills, when should they start practicing those? Well, the practicing with patients starting from the second year about the patient's care. And if you have an opportunity to practice on each other, that's a good idea to practice. And about the clinical practice on each other, general clinical practice, you should practice as much as you can. Primary, you should understand how normal things looks like than to uh, have a differentiation with the pathology. Without understanding the normal sound, the normal feeling, 
normal sensations of the fingers during the palpation, normal vibrations of the sound during the lung uh, chest palpation, you will not understand where is the pathology, where is the borders between normal and pathology. So you pass the topic, you talk to the teacher, you read the material about that, practice as much as you can. Okay, and then the last part of the question is, do students need to um, buy specific clothing such as scrubs for their clinical use um, or is the white coats fine as well as is there any other medical equipment students need to buy when entering into their clinical use? The good answer, good question actually, uh, depends on the branch of medicine that they will pick. If we're talking about internal medicine, lab code and changing shoes in the hospitals will be more than enough. Now, because of the COVID-19, you need to have a mask as well. But uh, it's not, it wasn't obligatory all the times. If you're talking about surgery, we have different zones in the department. We have general zone when everybody can enter. We have particularly restricted zones like dressing rooms, for example, that the person's supposed to enter only a medical staff and a patient that's supposed to be there, not visitors, nobody else. In these places, you're supposed to wear lab coats and change shoes. If you're talking about pre-operation and operation room restricted zones, you're supposed to have scrubs, short sleeve jacket, change pants, change shoes specific for the operation room. Different mm -hmm. ones from the one that you're using in the hospitals. And uh, if you want to enter the sterile zone to assist the operation, to stand just in front of the surgery table, inside the operation theater, you need to wear a sterile stuff. That's usually provided by the hospitals there. The quality, color, and everything else is uh, on your own decision. In our hospitals doesn't set the color, specific color for specific purposes or something like that. About the equipment that you need to buy, for an endoscope and stethoscope, that's obligatory for all the doctors. If you're a surgeon, you don't need even a stethoscope usually. You can set the diagnosis without a stethoscope or an endoscope. If you're an ENT doctor, you have this supposed to have or a mirror that reflecting light and allow you to see the nose and ears and throat or the flashlight in your hands. You have to, if you want, you can buy like otoscope, for example, or, or otorhinoscope, good thing actually. And well, depends on the branch of medicine that you pick, okay. the ones that you will use. Thank you so much, doctor. So our last question is actually for our social officers and it's to do with um, clubs and societies. So we'll bring them on and then the events team will wrap it up. Um, so this question was regarding sports and clubs and activities. So it was basically talking about, are there any sports societies currently? So we're still organizing the societies and the clubs. How that's gonna work is we're gonna have Google Forms sent out to everyone by email. Um, you'll have to fill out the form, um, enter you know, what kind of club it is or what kind of society it is, specify how many people are interested. Once we go over the details and see that it has enough interest and we can accommodate and it's a legit society or club, We'll then fast track it forward. Um, you'll be expected to write out a constitution, um, have a vice, a head, a treasurer. All of the details will be on the form. Um, yeah. Um, also, we, we are aware that already there are guys in Dnipro that are playing sports currently, football especially. So we'd want them to start the clubs with the SU. What we're trying to offer as well is a taster session for two weeks. So as the SU part of the budget would be to rent out the space for them for two weeks then after the two weeks people can then decide to pay a membership fee that will cover them for the year for said club and that will basically cover renting out the ground for the entire year yeah like the ground the kits any other equipment you need um any gatherings meetings you want to yeah plan. so we've already talked about basically if you want to do socials or weekly meetings having a lecture there so that you could use for that and basically a booking system to basically allocate what teams, clubs or societies will be in these places. So we're hoping to have that uh, up and running 
uh, after the croc. Yeah, so after about two, yeah. three weeks. After three weeks, it will all be set out. The meals will be set out. So yeah, keep an eye out for that. Um, I think that's I all. Think that's I hope it. that answers the question. Uh, we'll leave it to the event officers now. Yeah. So that concludes our evening. Thank you all for joining. Uh, we just want to give a special shout out to Olive, Akim, and Khadija who couldn't join us today. They're part of the SU members. Uh, but yeah, thank you all for joining. I hope you found it insightful and I hope it was helpful for you all. Um, if you have any more questions, just be sure to email them to us. We hope you're excited to start DMI. And if you have, we hope you're enjoying your lectures. So yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Bye. 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 Bye.